let's go are you ready let's do this let's do this everyone in the chat having a great time i see deathstroke neat sarah we got gerald kalki thomas Laika. we got lots of people in here i'm ready to go i hope you guys are ready to go too because we have a very special guest today and knowing seeing the thumbnail it's not much of a surprise so uh you know what are you what are you gonna do but i figured it would be weird if i just put like a silhouette and said special guest i figured i should announce it um i was i'm, I'm totally gonna spill the beans if i don't so without further jews we have a special guest everyone welcome the one and only mr maddie plays how you doing maddie how's it going buddy hello <laughs> um, everybody I, uh, I haven't been on a live stream thing in dumb long, so this is going to be exciting. Really? Uh, I'm really happy to be here, man. This oh, is uh, just a, a lot in the making. You know, We've talked a bunch of times beforehand. Uh, you're going to be on my podcast tomorrow. And yeah, I'm, I'm really hyped for this, man. It's going to yeah. be good. I'm pumped. Yes, we already recorded Maddie's uh, podcast yesterday, which if you're an astute viewer, I saw people speculating uh, on the Discord why I had to cancel my talk gaming episode yesterday. They're like, why would he do that? That's so weird. He must be doing something really important. And <laughs> somebody said, doesn't Maddie record his podcast on Fridays? Oh, <laughs> someone was like, so on top of it. Yeah, <laughs> they put it together. They're freaking wow. like wow. Sherlock Holmes here. Um, so they they got it and uh yes that's that's what we were doing we were recording uh podcast with maddie and uh carrick from acg we had a great time and we're gonna have a, a a fun time tonight so how this is gonna work guys is basically we're gonna go through we're gonna take questions spark up an actual discussion as you see we have the chat on screen so you can see what we're seeing kind of live participation and if you happen to watch this afterwards you can see uh what everyone in the chat is saying is, uh, as well um so uh yeah start throwing your questions in things that we can generate a discussion with and we can go from there but um yeah no I, i'm i'm pumped for this as i said i've been watching maddie since way back in the day i remember watching his very first podcast when it initially mm -hmm. launched it was i think it was before the reveal of fallout 4 at e3 and it was all about like yeah, e3 speculation before. Yeah, yeah, just before. I mean, I've seen you. You've commented on my stuff. I've seen your stuff before, especially as of recently. Those uh, those ultimate analysis videos <laughs> blowing up, making the rounds. Like, <laughs> how about that? That's that's awesome. How uh, YouTube's kind of transformed. We were talking about that off camera yesterday on how we've seen how different creators can step in and make these short discussion videos or the really uh, big breakdowns like you do, and and how you can find success anywhere. It's great stuff. Oh yeah, no. A lot of people are upset and frustrated with the um, changing landscape of YouTube, but I actually think that it's it's pretty cool, and it, it frustrates a lot of the bigger YouTubers because uh, they are trying to promote smaller guys. I'm not com complaining, obviously. Those <laughs> <Neither live>, uh, <laughs> big videos I've done, yeah, the big videos I've done uh, have done well, and I, I feel very blessed with that. Um, yes, we are using Comic Sans on the the chat tonight it was a, a joke somebody put in um on a live stream a couple weeks ago and we just stuck with it <laughs> why not yeah, careful what you wish for guys uh so marius thorvik asks the first sorted question i see um how did you guys feel about the bethesda e3 conference <laughs> well that answers his question for your end <laughs> yes um so i'll, I'll let you take the floor first offer us your thoughts obviously you're a bethesda centered channel or at least in the past you've been more focused on bethesda i'm still yeah i'd still say i'm definitely bethesda centered um you know for me it was that the stuff they showed at the end um such as wolfenstein the evil within uh definitely fans of those franchises so i was happy with that um but what e3 in general was missing i think for these past kind of two years um, and Bethesda's in particular was that slam dunk game. Um, and obviously it's hard to compete with that E3 2015 conference of Fallout 4 um, just because of that hype. It was just a, a magical time. But um, it, it just it felt like something was missing. And not only that, but we saw what happened with Nintendo where for me personally, it was shorter than Bethesda's conference, but they came out with all the big guns and they showed a lot. And it made me as a, a fan of my Switch pretty happy with their conference despite it being shorter so it wasn't really just the length it was also what they showed were a, a good half of it was dlc and mobile games and five other editions of skyrim so um i made a, a really long video on it but um the the short and simple 
version of it is that it was largely disappointing. That's just the best way to put it. Not because people were expecting like a Bethesda Game Studios game, but just that there were no surprises and also it was just lackluster with the content they brought out aside from two games. Mm. No, I, I would agree. It's tough with a company like Bethesda Softworks is not, they're big, but they're not as big as a, a Ubisoft or as a yep. an EA. So it's tough to fill out a like yearly conference. It, it's just tough. And I, I, I was surprised when they did uh, the E3 press conference last year because I thought they were just like when Bethesda said they were going to do an E3 conference, it would blow up and it was crazy and huge and everyone was blown away because they're like, okay, there's got to be something big to announce. Mm -hmm. But I, I swear, even um, uh, Pete Hines, he was the guy presenting, right? Um, Correct, yeah. Even he, like at the end of the conference, I saw it on his face. He was like, I don't, I'm not happy about this. Thanks for coming, guys. See, yeah. I felt bad for him. It's like they had his family in the back with a shotgun to their heads and said, you better end the conference. <laughs> Somebody else also suggested that perhaps they had another game that they were going to show that at the last minute they that know, was pulled the, out. Pardon me. That was the rumor. I can't confirm because I'm not sure if that's true, but that the rumor was they had something else to show. Uh, but I feel like that's just being insinuated because of, like you said, Peon's reaction. When he walked out, he he looked defeated already. Um, I don't know if he checked his Twitter mentions at that point in time or something like that. Because I know he catches, no matter what happens, he catches the shitstorm from fans, which I think is pretty unfair most of the time. But um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a shame. And like you said, he, he came out looking defeated. And I think that kind of set the tone for how they received it. Because I know uh, from personal interaction that it's not like they think the same as the suits. Like I remember one time at uh, at PAX East when they, it was just this past one. Um, I asked um, a person who worked at Bethesda about their review policy, basically saying, you know, what the, the hell's going on? Like this is so anti-consumer. And his response was, yeah, I have no idea what they're doing. You know, mm -hmm. and this is one of the PR. And I was like, well, if he doesn't agree with it, then who's making that call? So it's like, it, it seems like more and more as time goes on with Bethesda, you're seeing the suits really intervene instead of allowing creative control and all that type of stuff well i it makes me think of uh the whole take two debacle where mm -hmm. it's just a little bizarre somebody in a suit went on and said uh you know like okay we're done with open four let's get rid of that let's shut it down they hired lawyers to send cease and desist orders and then they backed out and it sounds like nobody in the actual game development actually cares. Um, there's just some times where you get a manager that comes in that used to work in, uh, you know, the Walmart board of directors comes in and says, well, we're giving up free money. Why are we doing that? Let's, let's stop that. And so they cut it off and it, it's just stupid. Um, but I, that's kind of the cost of having these massive public companies. You kind of get, uh, some big guys in suits that that uh don't really know much about the industry and they end up um they end up kind of screwing the pooch not well, in a yeah, good way because um a good example of that it was just from a video i was watching about battleborn and how some guy was saying uh how he's like he's like i'm not a battleborn founder because you know myself and many others bought battleborn at launch and it ended up being free to play which is fine but the reward they gave people for uh who bought the game at launch was like a, a little pack and it would give you one premium skin. It was, it was basically a slap in the face. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he was going on a rant about Randy Pitchford. And what sucks is that like, I don't have a big issue with Randy Pitchford, but, um, what's happening is like he and his uh, reaction to that situation where he came out a couple of journalists saying, no, it's not free to play, even though it's a clearly a free to play game. Now, um, it's representing that whole company now. And, and the same thing could be said for Bethesda, or uh, take two, where you got these suits stepping in, where the game side of things are like, you know, we have this good idea, we want to do this, we want players to be happy. But then the legal side of things, the, you know, the suits, the representatives, the faces of the company might not put on the best show and ultimately diminish the the quality of that brand. It, you know, it happens so much now, you see, but it's like not that shared vision as a whole. Mm -hmm. No, and so uh, like so often we end up with something where uh, a a company will come out, they'll do something really seemingly anti-consumer. It clearly pisses off a lot of people. I mean, you can even point to uh, Mass Effect Andromeda as an example of this, where they come out, they release this steaming pile of garbage, 
And then they act surprised when everyone's raving and ranting <laughs> yeah. against them. So what did you think was going to happen? And I think it's honestly because they thought that some of those higher ups, they thought they could get away with it. Um, so, and if they if they thought that it was uh, going to be an issue, then they, they would have delayed it and it would have been they would have been fine. Um, mm. Let's see another another comment. Uh, let's let's see. I lost it. Um, do, 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 do. Geralt says Battleborn. Oh God, I feel so bad for that game. I think everybody does. <laughs> yeah, because what's what's a shame about Battleborn is it was. I thought I thought it was a good game. It just it launched next to Overwatch, and I mm -hmm. love Overwatch too. But you know that I put tons of hours into both games, Overwatch way more. But you know it, it's just launched at the worst possible time and gamers created this faux rivalry between the two and it's like one's a MOBA one's a first person shooter competitively it's I don't know they, mm -hmm. they never matched up they just aesthetically were kind of similar and it's it's tough because that there was nothing they could do about it you know it's yeah. just that's what it is they they launched it didn't uh Battleborn technically launch first I think it launched first yes I'm pretty sure I think it launched like know, all I know is is that Overwatch launched I think May 20th and I'm pretty sure he had Battleborn was before that. Mm. It, it didn't like, matter when it was. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it was one of those things where people started by saying uh, that it was similar or that, you know, Overwatch did better. Streamers picked up Overwatch first and um, it, it just kind of took off. It's it, it's weird how that can happen, but um, I, I haven't played. I don't, I, th that type of game isn't really my thing to begin with. So mm -hmm. I'm not the best um, to comment on that. But some uh, obviously, Overwatch must be better just in some way. Otherwise, it wouldn't have won out. Um, and I'd like to think that the, the industry is a little smarter than just following trends, but that could also be it. Um, I say so. I mean, uh, not to cut you off, sorry, but no, just, I think Overwatch is a fantastic game. You mm -hmm. know, I know the, the most common complaint I see about Overwatch is the Team Fortress 2 clone thing. And I mean, I've tried TF2 and I, I just think I couldn't get into that game. So if anything, Overwatch was, you could say, the game TF2 was supposed to be. I don't know. <laughs> I mm -hmm. feel like I'd be throwing too much shade that way, you know, because I don't have an issue with the game. Just it didn't mesh well with me. Well, Overwatch, on the other hand, I have like 270 hours in. And wow. Yeah, considerable amount. Yeah. So. Yeah played a lot of overwatch and yeah. it's on console <laughs> yeah <That's> another thing <laughs> no it's uh I, I lost track so uh, just for reference a lot of people two people individually in the chat um usernames of emoji cow and ben's gaiman i believe they are yeah are spamming james all over the place point of clarification those are my brothers <laughs> two of my brothers they call me james for some reason uh and they have okay. infected the stream with it now as well so that's what that is for people uh concerned also people concerned about audio lag um on some of the videos that's just gonna that's just gonna happen so if that bugs you i'm sorry but that's just what it is um ratchet 570 what's your favorite game so far this year i'm assuming ratchet, each of us. ratchet i love you bro this guy he when we do uh viewer questions on the podcast he always has the best one so special really? shout out to him good yeah i want to hear your take though on uh what you're what you're liking this year i well this ties in and somebody else asked what our opinions are of um, Horizon Zero Dawn, and I think that that's an interesting conversation to have because my v opinion of that game has changed so many times in the last few months. It's it's kind of weird, and I'm still not settled completely on uh, what I think of it. But we'll we'll talk about that next. Um, but first, favorite game of the the year so far. There's been some standouts. Uh, I would say um, Resident Evil 7 was a big standout. I was very impressed with that, uh, especially because it came out in conjunction. Well, technically before, but in the same quarter, I believe, as uh, Outlast 2, which I don't know if you played that one, Maddie. Um, I have not. It's I, I don't recommend it. If you play Resident Evil 7, that's all you need in terms of horror for this year. Outlast 2 was an attempt to just be grotesque. And it's seriously, I've used this many times before. I think what they did is they all sat around a table, said, what's the most messed up thing we can think of putting in a video game? Somebody says, well, what if we had a chick get raped and then pregnant and then a stillbirth? Like, they go through all these horrendous things and they say, yeah, let's put that in the game. It's just ridiculous and disgusting. As a horror thing, thing, mm. I guess, it works. But as a game, 
it it was more disturbing than fun or entertaining. So I, I was not a fan of it. But Resident Evil Seven, I thought, struck a balance that was really really good. Um, oh, okay. Didn't yeah, great game. Didn't have the same Ludo narrative dissonance that Outlast Two had. It was uh, I was very impressed with that. Horizon Zero Dawn initially I would put it up at, at near the top of the list for the year so far. As I've gotten away from that game, the lower it has dropped. Uh, it's like once I take off the rose tinted glasses, I lose um, favor for that one, and we can talk about that next. Uh, but Breath of the Wild so far. I think I've put the most time into, but I've been playing Hollow Knight, which is the game, uh, the gameplay that I was playing um, during the pre-show. That game, I am wildly impressed with. It's scratching my Bloodborne itch right now, and I'm very happy with it. If you have a, if you're a Bloodborne fan, anybody out there, highly recommend that you play uh, Hollow Knight. It's like nine dollars right now, and they deserve every penny of that. And it's coming to the Switch sometime, uh, probably later this summer or early fall, which my life's gone at that point um <laughs> but i don't know what games have been a standout for you oh um i kind of have a top three in my head that hasn't changed all that much i have to say and like you said we'll get into it a little bit but i do agree that as time has gone on when it comes with uh, horizon zero dawn i still think it's an excellent game but i feel like uh what really stood out to me with that was its universe but yeah as, as time goes on it starts to i feel it'll fall down my list a little bit um it's easily the one that will move out of my top three because mm -hmm. the other two are solidified i really have trouble thinking of any games that can beat it um and they're just like neck and neck where it's hard to pick one and two it's like they're both number one in my eyes mm -hmm. uh but the number two spot would be persona five um mm -hmm. i have been a persona fan for a while Persona 4 Golden is one of my favorite games of all time. And uh, I thought going into Persona 5, you know, because it was getting a lot of mainstream attention, a lot of new fans were coming in, I was really afraid they were going to, uh, for lack of better words, dumb down the franchise. Right. Um, provide less choice consequence, you know, because I, I love the, the kind of double life you can live in Persona. And uh, if anything, they provided more choice. And what always astounds me with Persona 5 was that... The game's easily 120 to 30 hours long. Oh, yeah. Really long game. And the fact that they can tell a full, cohesive story throughout that entire span and not lose track or focus at all just blows my mind. Because we see games struggle to do that at the 10-hour, 20-hour mark. You know, they lose pace. They have pacing problems and all that stuff. And somehow Persona just keeps the ball rolling, keeps it going, keeps it interesting and fresh. Um, and I think that's just astounding. You know, it's such an impressive game on so many levels. But the one game that's really beat it by inches um, is for number one right now for me is uh, Nier Automata. Mm -hmm. um, 2017 has been an amazing year for gaming as far as I'm concerned. You know, there have, as with any year, been some disappointments. But um, I got to say, man, I'm so happy with this year because uh, this is the first game to crack my top 10 games like I've ever played in my life uh, since... Uh, I always say uh, Bioshock Infinite, and before that was Fallout 3. So, like, this is a list I, I don't alter all that much, but uh, Nier Automata, I really like this game a lot because it's one of those games that doesn't strive for perfectionism like we see a lot of amazing games do. We were talking about The Last of Us on our podcast a lot mm -hmm. and how that's, like, one of those... I feel like that's one of those games that strives to be, like, the perfect game where Nier Automata really goes to send a message to really make you think after the credits rolled, but it's still an amazing video game uh, in the terms of combat, difficulty options, uh, building your character, uh, not only in the terms of gameplay-wise, but the way they actually build the character as a person, um, so fantastically done. Um, the perspectives uh, through the narrative, I could go on and on. Existentialism is a major theme in the game. It's just, it's a game I, I cannot uh, rave about enough, but I'm ranting at this point. <laughs> it's a game that I, I usually sum up by saying, just play it. Mm. <laughs> it's just, just play it. Well, I, I bought Persona 5 as well. I got the Steelbook version, which was really cool. I didn't mean to buy the Steelbook version, but I went into, to, I think, GameStop and said, I'm looking for Persona 5. And I, I he just checked out. I was talking with the guy about how stupid all of the Switch shortages were. And uh, so I, I paid for it, walked out, and I was like, oh, this one looks weird. I'm not used to this, but it, it's cool. Um, and Persona 5, I think, is a game that... 
like if any game was destined or would excel on the switch i think it's a persona game because as Absolutely. you said it's a massive game that's incredibly long so much so that on the load screens they have take your time in the bottom right hand corner during every yeah. load sequence they're trying to tell you this is going to be a long experience be patient let it give yourself over to it basically and mm -hmm. for my life it took me a month to beat <laughs> Yeah, no, and that was the problem for me is that I was thinking and playing around with the idea of doing these longer uh, critique style videos. And, and so to do a video uh, or to play a game, a single game for a month exclusively would be excessive for me. So, uh, but the, one of the reasons I could really throw myself into Zelda and Breath of the Wild was because I could take it anywhere. So I'd be sitting outside my advanced accounting class, uh, beating Thunderblight Ganon. And I, when I was done or right before I had to go in, I could pause in the middle of the fight, put it to sleep, put it in my bag and go about my business and then pick it up right after class. And that was great. It filled up all those little gaps when I would have just been sitting there like watching a YouTube video, which I think is the power of the switch to, to do that. Unfortunately, I think uh, Nintendo's focusing more on the, the home console side, but I think they should focus more on the portability, but then we get into the switch, but, um, no, I, I will eventually get around to playing Persona 5. I hope they can port it. I uh, completely elsewhere. agree on the uh, portability aspect because uh, Persona 4 Golden uh, and 3 Portable are, are both on uh, the, the Vita, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, Persona 4 is about like an 85-hour game, but I, I flew through it in like a week because I could take it on the go. So like you said, um, I remember I was taking my grandma to the doctors one time and, you know, I was I was there for a few hours. And so I was just sitting in the waiting room on my Vita the whole time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I completely agree that, yeah, it's, it fills in those gaps. So you, you get more of it done. Um, there was a, a trademarking for Persona 4. It, it said or Persona 5. It was like P5G and it was official. So mm. they're probably going to make a Persona 5 Golden and it'll probably be on mobile platforms of some kind. I'd be ready for it because uh, Persona 5 originally was built for the PS3, right? Yes, it launched in Japan on the on the PS3. So it's uh, I I think with that being said, I mean PS the Switch is capable of running that generation of games. We've seen like we're seeing uh, 360 and PS3 ports to the Switch, so it's powerful enough to run those games on the whole. Mm -hmm. So I I see no reason why they couldn't couldn't uh, throw it on there. And I I mean obviously Persona Five is not a, a graphically demanding game. No, nah, it's um, all art style. Yeah, it's it's massive. So you'd have to. I mean, that's a game that you would need to get like a micro SD card on for sure. <laughs> that's not going on your your internal storage. Um, but uh, yeah, no, there's just there's a lot of of great games. But going off of Horizon Zero Dawn. Um, Horizon Zero Dawn, I'll just throw out my quick opinion. For me, Horizon Zero Dawn was initially very impressive because I was I was blown away at how it looked. It was smooth and it was uh, pretty fun, at least at first. And then as I started to settle into it, it slowly became more and more, it felt more and more shallow where they had these dialogue choices, but the choices didn't mean anything. It's like at the first like year of development, they're like, this is going to be an RPG with tons of branching storylines. And then they gave up on that as they went through. And then by the time I got to the end of the game, I was just kind of uh, blown away because it seemed like a tech demo that was setting up the actual game which would eventually be the sequel to horizon zero dawn and that's what i feel to horizon zero dawn serves uh, and its primary purpose is not to be a great game i think the primary purpose is to set it up for the sequel that will be the great game so if i had to regrade it i gave it like a b when i initially uh, reviewed it i would say right now we'd probably get like a high c i thought it was average visually very impressive but in terms of gameplay I i've heard carrot go on and on about it but for me it just it didn't hit me it didn't sink in with me um what are your thoughts <clears throat> um well i guess it, it really boils down to flavor when it comes down to it because um for me, like I'm big on on game universe and you know making that place I'm exploring interesting. And uh, if Horizon Zero Dawn hit a home run in any area, it was the universe they established. The, you know through the narrative, uh, you know walking around uh, these overgrown areas, it's seeing rusted, curved over buildings, wondering what happened, uh, why these machines are how they are. 
Uh, they present a really interesting uh, universe and mystery. So for me, I, I wouldn't downgrade it a lot, but I, uh, f when I really do look at it and as it falls down my list, it's it's like you said, it's because of the gameplay, because it's you're just kind of switching arrows. Uh, it was very Tomb Raider-esque, and I've never been big on the new Tomb Raider games. Um, I was really disappointed with the first one, um, beat that, and the second one I, I couldn't even get a quarter of the way through, and I just had to put it down. Um, but yeah, I agree. The, the gameplay kind of lets down a little bit. It, it's a little creative, though, such as being able to tie down the big machines and then hit them in their weak spots. Mm. Um, but it does kind of grow a little tedious, I think the best word is, over time. I'd agree. But um, yeah, it's, like I said, I appreciate a good universe. I, I appreciate a good story. And I thought the gameplay was enough to uphold, uh, to keep that narrative going, where you know it was interesting enough to, to keep me going along. Uh, but then, yeah, once you roll credits and you go back to the open world and you're doing those side activities, yeah, you, you notice those issues like the dialogue tree. You know, you're mm -hmm. like, why is this even a thing? Um, the Those caves you go into, um, I'm forgetting the name of them, but you you go inside them and, ah, oh, fuck, what are they called? Um, whatever, it doesn't matter, though, but they yeah. have like eight of those. You know, I, I think you, the people will know what I'm talking about. Yeah, <laughs> no, I know what you're talking inside. about, yeah. <laughs> um, I can't remember the name of it because I haven't played it since February. But yeah, like you know, they they have those little elements where it starts to feel like a little bit of a Ubisoft game afterwards, in a way, the the bad kind of Ubisoft game. So yeah, that's why it's it's slipping down my list a little bit, and I I might switch that with Resident Evil Seven because I that's a game that's held up so well. I mean, I freaking beat it three times. It's a short game, but still, mm -hmm. man, what a game! And uh, I mean, another honorable mention because I know. Um people are, are gonna be upset i didn't mention this uh like neo was also very very impressive for a lot of people i haven't given it uh, in my opinion due time to pr give an, an informed opinion on it the uh setting wasn't wasn't my favorite but that like we talked we actually talked about this on on maddie's podcast so if you want to hear this whole discussion um <laughs> i'll cut it off now so that you can go watch that on on his podcast but we, we went into this with uh, carrick as well um, i feel like neo you would enjoy but you'd have the same problem i did with the mob enemies because you love bloodborne like i do and, and you know it's because the, those mod enemies are varied they go with the location you're going into and, and in neo it's kind of the, the same enemies attacking you with cool bosses but yeah you can break that game down pretty easily Mm -hmm. um so yeah just disclosure so <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, avoid the pedantic comments um also yes people are liam shaw noticed my shirt let me figure out how to show this there derek zoolander center for kids who can't read good that's what the shirt says <laughs> zoolander is a great movie i love it to death and uh <laughs> that's what that is so good good catch everybody it's not like it's hard to see um so uh let's see do, do 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 i lost my place there was uh people are lots of people are asking about what games we bought on sale uh we go through this on on maddie's podcast as well but what i will say um i haven't bought a ton of games i've bought uh hollow knight was one that i got i got um uh what was the other i got wolfenstein which I never played um, for some reason. I got a couple other games. What what was one that... Um, well, Nier, uh, Nier Automata or Automata. I can never pronounce it right. Automata. Oh, yeah, it always takes me two tries. Sake, so that you don't get those comments. <laughs> yeah, it always takes me two tries. Uh, but anyway, Nier is on sale. It's like 30% off right now. So you can get it for like 42 bucks and that's, that's a bit of a steal. Um, so I highly recommend that you uh, guys try that one if you haven't already. Um, also, uh, right now, if you have P PlayStation Plus, this is slightly off topic, but if you have Play, uh, PlayStation Plus, you can get Until Dawn for free, which... Oh, it, yes. That's a great like, party game. It doesn't seem like, like it would be. Game. That's a great party game. You're so right. Yep, that is so true. I would never even think of that, but that is so true. It's hilarious. What we would do is we would all sit in front of the TV and we'd be playing it and then we'd actually hand off the controller and you know it's all about these split second decisions that you have to make in that slight moment and uh, you know if you mess up slightly everyone's going to be bashing <laughs> that mm -hmm. kid for the rest of the night it's it's always awesome um civ 6 also had a significant discount if i remember correctly uh and the witcher 3 is 50 percent off so if you guys have seen my videos and you still haven't played the witcher 3 somehow 
this is the perfect time to I buy it. I was going to say, I don't, I don't know how someone could watch your channel and not say, like, I should try The Witcher, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know. I'm not, this guy doesn't, uh, you know, suck up to it enough. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, willing to for, admit. For me, um, just recently, I bought a couple of games on sale. Um, one of them was Black, what's it called? Black Desert Online. Um, oh. That's an MMO I wanted to try. Uh, it just looks interesting. I don't know how deep I'll get into it because MMOs are pretty big commitments. Jade Empire. Um, this is a game from the old school Bioware. Uh, I've never played it before. A lot of viewers have recommended it to me because I love Knights of the Old Republic. So that was three bucks. And I was like, okay, yeah, I can't really make a mistake at three bucks. Yeah. So I went with that. And um, right now, nothing else is coming up on my. Yeah, that should be about all I bought during this sale. I've been trying to be smart with the money, but I'm looking at the, the Steam page right now. I mean, some of these sales are, are ridiculous. Um, mm -hmm. Nazi Zombie Army for nine bucks. State of Decay for nine bucks as well. That's a that's a hidden gem in my opinion. Sleeping Dogs is five dollars. That's another game that um, if you haven't played, sadly the studio who developed it shut down. Ooh. So um, yeah, now there, there's not going to be a sequel, but um, it's still a game very much well worth playing. Yeah, your uh, Civ Six is thirty five dollars. Um, it's on a 40% discount, like you said. Um, yeah, those are just a couple. Witcher 3 is, is probably the biggest deal, though. It's mm. no surprise that's in the top five. 25 bucks for the game and all its DLC. That's so that's so much content for 25 bucks. You can yeah. literally play that game for months on end. Now, oh. I, I've played through it so many times. and I, like, Let's talk about that for a second. Um, Chris Griffin in the chat. I apparently cartoons can watch um chris griffin in the chat says no offense luke but the witcher 3 is overrated as a game as a story it's excellent and i think that's an interesting thing because we're seeing a change we're seeing a shift in every decade i'd say there's um, a focus in terms of gaming as to where it shifts so in like the 2000s i'd say it was more focused on general gameplay that's when we saw open worlds take the focus Mm -hmm. and become really popular uh it, you know in the 90s it was all about switching from 2d to 3d and improving that um and in the the 20 teens it seems like we've been moving much more towards uh, narrative focused games think of some of the biggest games of the year uh or of the last few years um many of them are incredibly narrative focused now not for everybody of course i'm saying if your favorite game of all time is a bloodborne or is a, a dark souls type game which has it has narrative and it has story but it's very shallow in how it's uh told that's fine, that's fine. And those games are incredible, don't get me wrong, but The Last of Us, for instance, as a game, The Witcher 3 as a game, which uh, all of these are promoted as very massive, su massively successful and popular games, those are all games which have slowly started focusing more and more on narrative. So do you see that trend as well, or, or do you think it's just a coincidence that some of these games <sighs> blow up? Uh, well, yeah, I don't think it's a coincidence. Um, when you start... <laughs> My thing is, I always go to, when you see every big AAA game that comes out always has a Reddit thread or an article or something posted saying, you know, insert game here versus The Witcher 3. That's when you know, like, that's <laughs> that's the game everyone's comparing it to. Uh, I, I remember before Persona 5 came out, there was already an article about uh, Persona 5 versus The Witcher 3, even though they're two totally different totally games. Totally different. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the point being is that, you know, that's when you know they're, that's a... a amazing video game that everyone wants the industry to trend towards which um i think it, it sadly it does what uh we've always expected of games it gave us this full game you know there weren't bugs as far as i remember um it was a complete narrative it was an exciting journey it was well written there was choice and consequence uh open world lots of quests you, know, you got that sixty dollars worth basically mm -hmm. um and there was no bs and they continued to support it with free dlc for I think 18 pieces of it or something like that after launch immediately. Uh, that definitely kept players hooked, even though some of it was just weapons and little things. It was still this thing of, we gave you this big game and more. Hmm. And then you get two excellent pieces of DLC, like uh, Heart of Stone. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. And um, uh, Blood and Wine. And so I think that's kind of what it's doing, is filling this void, setting an example where maybe, uh, I'm a believer, I love The Witcher 3, but you know I'm not sitting there like, oh, it's the best game ever. <laughs> Uh, but I think 
I, I think it's worthy of respect. I think it's worthy of that gold standard. And it does absolutely set that example of the, the bar where developers should, should strive to go for. So that's what I think more than anything a lot of gamers need to recognize is it might not be your big cup of tea because you, know, you were saying, Luke, how, oh, The Witcher is, is my fantasy RPG. You know, and for me, it's most definitely Elder Scrolls. Mm -hmm. um, and that's okay because at the end of the day, I can completely say that The Witcher is probably better than most Elder Scrolls games. So it's like, you know, you got to respect the game and, and what it's done for the industry. Mm -hmm. No, I, I would agree. And I have no hard feelings against a game like uh, uh, like Skyrim. I'm, obviously, I think Skyrim is phenomenal, but it's mm -hmm. phenomenal for very different reasons um compared to the witcher 3 which i would also find phenomenal and people have different tastes if you don't think that the witcher 3 is good um then that's that's fine some people you know i i, I okay i introduced the game to my brothers those same ones that were uh spamming james in the chat and um so it's a, a group of three brothers ben jacob and timmy and ben he didn't really connect with the game at all he's a skyrim fan uh jacob tried it but lost interest after a little while, you know, the gameplay loop wasn't as attractive to him. So he shifted and played something else. But my little brother, Timmy, he's completely lost himself in that game. I woke up this morning, walk out there and he's playing The Witcher 3 and it just hooked him. So as I mean, I think in many ways that group of three people pretty clearly shows how people will approach it either it's not Absolutely. interesting at all and they'll just stick with skyrim um i have a friend who's put nine thousand hours into skyrim like insanity and mm, that's a lot <laughs> that's a lot that i think that's almost a full year of gameplay time it's unholy but um <laughs> so he's he's put a lot of time but uh like you know jacob tried it didn't really connect with it he went like five hours through the game before he got any potions even brewed and that will screw you over in that game you have to yeah. take it very seriously unfortunately or maybe fortunately and uh in many ways you know i've said it before i think you, some games you have to give yourself over persona 5 i'd say it's a, exactly the same where you have to s basically sell your soul to that game for a little while yeah, and if you sure. do you'll have an incredible experience but if you don't yeah. you're gonna end up saying well, i don't i don't get it you know i'm missing something what is this i don't know um, yeah and and off what you said you know different games do different things for different people where uh you know there are elder scrolls fans for example who um you know skyrim they like that freedom but they appreciate morrowind for its its replayability absolutely you know there there's that real choice and consequence where you can uh, kill like the main villain right off the bat and ain't end the quest mm -hmm. like right into the game so it's it's crazy when you can do certain things like that um, where you, you can't really do that in uh, The Witcher 3, for example, or as far mm -hmm. as I know. And so, um, you know, that's the other thing is some people like that, but says the game studio's freedom. And we're not trying to get into that comparison strictly, but it's just the idea that some people like that freedom where Witcher 3 is arguably more uh, narratively focused because you have Geralt as that set protagonist and you're kind of imprinting your vision, your Geralt onto the game uh, as compared to those Bethesda games, those games where players really like the freedom of like, this is my stamp on the world. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like if you don't like The Witcher 3 or you don't like Elder Scrolls, you're wrong about it either. It's, it's just a taste, you know? Mm -hmm. Certain things just match up with different people. No, oh, I, I completely, completely agree. Um, so let's see, what, what are other people saying in the chat? Um, let's see. So this is, this is also an interesting thing. People, um, Hypnotopotamus, hypnopotamus, oh, I don't know what, whatever it is, said uh, Skyrim plus mods equals life. And that, that makes me think of something. So Bethesda's games are very heavily dependent, I think it's fair to say, on the modding community. So much so that, like, that friend of mine who's put 9,000 hours into Skyrim, I asked him, would you have put that time in if you hadn't? used mods and if you could only play it on like the 360 or something and he said no no way there's no way i could um and so it's, at what point do we stop complimenting skyrim because it's almost like bethesda game studios games and, and games like skyrim for instance they're not even the same game by the end of 
the the um the time that people are spending with it because by the end of it they've installed so many mods they've changed the game fundamentally from what it initially was that it's basically not the same game it's almost a new thing i i don't know what are your thoughts on that uh, yeah I, I get what you're saying uh my thing is i guess the props to bethesda probably uh ends where it's like okay they have enabled gamers to even make those choices to keep that game alive you, you definitely want to give the modders all the credit for creating the content to keep the game alive. Uh, they totally deserve it. They bust their ass. But uh, when it comes to Bethesda enabling it, there isn't as moddable of, as the title as a BGS one. Because like you said, yeah, you can, you know, start up a new playthrough and it's a totally different game. Uh, that's that's what really sparks those new playthroughs for a lot of BGS gamers. Uh, where even Fallout 4, you're really not making much choice and consequence there. But, you know, with those mods, you can, for example, I remember I was revitalized to make a, another playthrough simply because there was this one mod that added just green overgrown grass everywhere along the map and like on the sides of buildings and everything. And it just gave this game this different flavor where it was still Fallout 4, it was still the same conversations, but it was that little visual tweak that was enough to hook me in for another run. And so... It's those little tweaks like that and uh, why I think gamers obsess about the BGS titles because they know when they buy the game, they're hopefully getting that uh, excellent quality from them. Um, but then afterwards, they know that the modders who are just as good quality uh, are going to provide more content for them down the line. So I think the excitement really brews from that. Uh, once again, the bang for your buck. You're, you're paying 60 bucks and getting <laughs> 9,000 hours. That's, that's insanity. It's mm -hmm. unheard of. Oh, it's it's absolutely crazy. I mean, the last time you get close to that is something like a uh, wow, which people have also lost mm -hmm. their lives with, or two, I suppose. Because um, the but, the developer end, sorry, I, I just thought the developer end of things is probably like procedural generation. Like that's usually their solution to give you that endless gameplay. So it's like, why not put it in your players' hands and have them create stuff? You know, that's the other thought I had. Right. Um, and yeah, in many ways, I think Bethesda can deliver really cool um, uh, containers and vessels for overall uh, improvements. And, and the modding community over there is absolutely phenomenal and it honestly blows me away. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's an interesting distinction to make. Uh, so another question we're seeing a lot from several people are people asking, what are your thoughts on Assassin's Creed Origins. Hmm. I'm gonna have to think on that for a sec. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you're fine. You're fine. I've uh, I've d made a few videos on it, discussing it a little bit. I just like ancient Egypt as a setting, so for me, that's already interesting enough. But Lord knows they have a lot they need to do in order to uh, to win back a lot of the fans they've lost over the few, last few years, but they took a year off 2016, no Assassin's Creed that year. So, um, I don't know if that's going to save the, the title or, or make it excel past where we expect it to be. But, uh, based off what you saw at E3, what did you think of it? I mean, the, the first thing that, uh, there were, there were some weird finicky things like i i don't like when games for example you throw up something into the air and you see it in ubisoft games a lot whether it's a, a drone or a bird of some kind and it spots all the enemies for you and then you just go around and pick them off one by one uh, i think that ruins a lot of the game personally uh because it just doesn't make sense like you, you have a bird in the sky and somehow you know where everyone is you know i, I just it breaks that immersion that i have uh, the other thing that was weird, it's a nitpick, but it, it was just that the, the boats went flying. <laughs> they were so fast, and you're just rowing them like... Like 90 okay, miles can, an hour. Yeah, yeah, it's like, all right, this is a, a fucking speedboat. But um, as for the game in general, I agree, Ancient Egypt is an interesting setting. I've been having my fingers crossed for years for a feudal Japan Assassin's Creed game. I'm hoping one day they do it. But uh, for what it is, I am intrigued. I've missed Assassin's Creed. Um, if anything, with how the franchise has steadily gone downhill, I'd call it a guilty pleasure now. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I like it. I liked what I saw enough to, to keep me intrigued. Um, the new combat and loot system, definitely unexpected. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that what they do is uh, something that Ubisoft kind of did with uh, Watch Dogs 2, which is filled the world open world with things of substance, interesting things to do uh, to make me want to keep playing. Because uh, before that, it was usually like, climb the tall thing, here's a bunch of collectibles in this vicinity, 
go get them. And that was it. And then a little story. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that they uh, took some notes from Watch Dogs, too, personally. Yeah. No, I, I think they are probably taking some serious notes from a lot of different games. Uh, I don't know if you saw the map size for Origins. It's the entire friggin' country. Wow. It's the entire It looks Actually, like... I, I remember now. They saw th there was like an ocean. It was kind of mm -hmm. like uh, faded out. And it was like clouds or something, right? And as yep. you explore the clouds... Yeah, okay. Then I've seen part of it. Yeah, no, and this is made by the same team that did Black Flag, uh, which I just did a big critique on as well. But th that was actually... The reason I did the critique was because I figured it's the same team. Ashraf Ismail, who's the guy that directed... Um, uh, Black Flag is also the lead director. He's the guy that spoke at the E3 conferences about Origins, and he said that they're taking a lot of inspiration from a lot of other games, but what it looks like is that Origins is actually going to have the same map structure as The Witcher 3, where there's actual like huge provinces almost, and then okay. those you have to there's a load screen between them it's not a seamless country basically but they have all the different regions that you can follow the nile all the way up there's uh of course alexandria um because we're talking 59 bc i believe is when they said it's set and so there's a lot of potential but i would agree certain elements of it certainly are not uh are not focused on realism um but I, I, they have a chance here. They have a real chance to reinvigorate the series and re-energize players with it. Looks like they might be going and doing a trilogy um, with it. The original leaker who said it was called Assassin's Creed Origins and predicted it was set in ancient Egypt and all this stuff he said that eventually turned out to be true. He went and uh, he also said they're looking at doing a trilogy set where after this game, the same protagonist will go to Rome and then we'll Rome. go to, to like Greece. And so you're going to have this trilogy, almost like the original uh, trilogy, um, Ezio trilogy, all based on that, which I, I think could be cool. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with it. But they, they have a lot to prove uh, to me and to many other gamers because Lord knows they've rushed stuff out in the past. But Ubisoft mm -hmm. seems like they might be getting their act together. Speaking about this as well, people are also asking about uh, Far Cry 5. What are your thoughts on Far Cry? That's another one. I was, I was really surprised at E3 uh, at how interested I was um, with the... The concept of bringing it to the table very different uh you know people can hate on ubisoft all they want they've never really shied away from telling a, a personal modern story a, a relatable one um if anything you know and and getting kind of who knows it political but um you know something that people will see and instantly relate to modern day uh culture mm -hmm. so i have to give them props for that that definitely <clears throat> caught my interest uh but when i saw the game itself um you know i, I remember seeing like these guys having a bunch of hostages and they were hitting them with bats and stuff and it was uh, really heavy mm -hmm. um and i never got that vibe from a far cry game since three where uh you know it's this really overbearing atmosphere um and so it definitely has me interested because uh far cry 4 was as far as i'm concerned uh kind of a misstep they tried just to include like 40 million different gameplay elements and and <laughs> totally threw the the universe out the window the, the story and everything and you know, they, they tried to do this, like, co-op thing. It, it's just, no, let's just reset. Mm. Let's go back and see what worked, like, in Far Cry 2 and 3. And, and, and I see a lot of that DNA in Far Cry 5, personally. So right. I'm excited. Well, it's interesting because they had the whole, um, with Far Cry Primal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> forgot that existed. <laughs> yeah. Well, it looks like they did, too, because they went, they did that game. And all of a sudden, it's like they they did that it was like okay we're gonna give our team kind of a break for a couple of years let them do something different and fun and then they just uh, like left it and it's like okay that that happened i guess that was weird and i, I don't know that was just weird that whole mm -hmm. game was just out of nowhere and the copied map oh god yeah it was it was just a weird i don't know how, what else to say just weird um Let's see. Snipe TV asks, do you guys have any predictions for Cyberpunk 2077 and The Last of Us Part 2? I'll let you go first. All right. Uh, Cyberpunk. Um, I guess prediction-wise, I mean, one one interesting thing, I'd rather say this is a hope, 
is that we see Siri in there because at one point she says at the uh, mm. end of, or not really then, but when Geralt and her first meet up, she she describes where she time traveled to or something along those lines, and she describes what is cyberpunk setting. So mm. uh, one thing that my fingers are crossed for is to have like a little cameo of her in there. Uh, but prediction wise, I, I'm I'm really just crossing my fingers that uh, what CD Projekt Red has said about I think it was a 2020 or 2021 release date, or maybe it was 19. I'm not sure. Uh, but that that comes true. Um, I, I feel it will. Um, they they are a good company when it comes to uh, confronting their consumers and saying like, look, this is how it's going to be. Not going through like the news and stuff like that. Just telling us straight up how it's going to mm-hmm. be. So um, I'm I'm pretty confident that's what will happen. But then again, Witcher Three had a couple of delays, but it, it worked out entirely to its benefit. So I'm not going to complain. Uh, as for The Last of Us Two, uh, prediction wise, I think it's I, I'm really going to get bold and say that I think it's going to end up being better than the first Last of Us, which I think is such a masterpiece of a game. Mm-hmm. The reason I say that is just because it's Naughty Dog. They somehow have, and I'm not a big Uncharted fan, but even in that series, I can respect that like they've managed to exceed expectations and continually make games better. Same thing with Jack and Daxter. This, just the series always gets better with each entry and the new tech they use. So I, I just, I feel like it's going to be an immensely better game just off of their pedigree. Mm. Do you follow Neil Druckmann on Twitter? I do not. Uh, he's he's the creator and director of The Last of Us, and he also is the creative director behind Uncharted 4. Um, I, I've called him gaming's prodigy in the past. I think he's he's brilliant. He's really young. He's from Israel. He's a coder, but he something about him. He knows how to make a compelling narrative in video games which is something not many people know how to do they they are either really good at storytelling or they're really good at making video games and rarely they cross over but he just has some knack for it where he gets it i don't know what it is but um on his twitter he posts all these pictures of them in their motion cap uh, mocap uh, sessions for the last of us part two and so you see all these goofy out of context <laughs> shots of uh the actors doing absurd things and it's it's really funny so i recommend you check that out and whoever you are out there i also recommend you check it out as well um okay. but no as for that cyberpunk i'd say a 2019 release date uh, t- slash 2020 would be fair um it's going to be a massive game they're apparently trying to mix in some online elements which worried a lot of people but my guess is the reason they're doing it is because they want to do a massive world with a seamless multiplayer mixed in it'll be weird whatever they're doing and it's possible like uh when we got the the message about the hostage situation that they were they had people hack in and steal some oh, yeah. materials from early development and then they made it very clear they said those materials they stole do not reflect the current state of the game which i thought was a weird caveat to say it's like well then why are we so concerned about it but either way they said that which makes me think maybe they moved away from that because that was what they initially were pressing and filing uh trademarks and stuff for so we'll just have to see what happens um i think it'll be whatever it is it'll be massive and they're gonna try to take their time with it um so whatever it is i hope it's good uh the siri crossover could be really cool somebody pointed out i I believe that's also in the books um the actual description of the the sort of surreal futuristic setting that might be wrong that person might be full of crap but somebody did comment on the video i did on that uh, saying that it was in the books as well but either way it's a bloody clear coincidence and if they didn't want to do that crossover or draw that comparison, they probably wouldn't. They probably would have just cut that line, yeah, absolutely. or rewritten it. It's so it, clear. it was too obvious. <laughs> yeah, no, there's in my mind, there's no real doubt, um, no real doubt there. So uh, Ratchet five seventy again is asking, uh, what about Shadow of War? That looks cool. And this is interesting because Shadow of War is a game that they came out early. They said, we're making this game, look at it, here's some gameplay. And it seems like every other day, there's a new 20-minute gameplay video that comes out. where there, it, it gets to the point where by, by the time we get to release, it's like there's nothing lo- else to see. I already know yeah. the game backwards and forwards. I think it's the other side of this excessive secrecy. It's the other side of the coin when they're just so open about it that it's there's no real excitement at least for me i'm not as pumped for that game as i think i i would have been otherwise but i don't know what are your thoughts ah man i you know 
the way I sit on the the Shadow of Mordor slash War series is that um, I love the Nemesis system, but like if you're decent at video games and it almost becomes irrelevant immediately because you're not dying and you're not creating rivalries and you're killing everything, so they're not getting mad at you and they're not escaping. So these this orc rivalry system just be becomes nothing mm -hmm. and then you have a middle earth game based off of arkham combat and you're brutalizing him so it's still fun i put a ton of time like 35 ish hours into middle earth shadow of mortar so i do like it but i got to agree yeah shadow of war they're overkilling it um when i initially saw the gameplay i was intrigued but i instantly said this looks like more of the same for better or for worse depending on the type of gamer you are not that if you uh i should clarify if you you know died in the game or something it's not that you're a bad gamer and uh, it's not that you're bad at video games, but more so just for me, I, I didn't die all that often. So mm -hmm. for me, it, like I said, it just it kind of became irrelevant. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's struggling to grab my attention, especially now that there's a delay. Um, you know, they had a good idea there to just reveal it, release date in August it originally was. I was like, whoa, yeah. you know, that's soon. I'm so excited. Uh, and then they delay it to October, and October is jam-packed. So... Uh, now it's a game that has to take a back seat, unfortunately, because they put it in a crowded month. Yep. And I don't know. I, I It's a little weird because that game, it was in many ways a sleeping giant for a while where people didn't realize how massive uh, that that game, uh, Shadow of Mordor, was. But that, that game was huge. And it's kind of like mm -hmm. State of Decay, where secretly incredible, nobody really seems to realize, but it sold so many copies like one or two million copies i think is the number i saw something like that a huge number of copies of that game have sold but nobody ever really talks about it and i i think they could have been better served to be, uh, highlight shadow of war a little more not shown off tons um and uh kind of let it let it shine instead of just getting it out there like it's no big deal um i think it could have been a, a big deal i think it could have been fun um Let's see, uh, Adam Hirschberger, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, but that looks about right. Uh, it says, how do you guys feel about Life is Strange Before the Storm? Life is Strange is one of my all-time favorites, and I'm super ready for Before the St Storm's release in late August. Any Life is Strange fans here? Um, probably a few, probably a few. I just played through Life is Strange with my girlfriend. I, we went through The Last of Us, we went through... Um, well, we tried going through a couple other games, but we then went through all of uh, Life is Strange. And it's developed by Don't Nod. They did, uh, of course, um, Life is Strange, and they're coming out with Vampire. Uh, and so we'll one. just see what happens. I The actor's voice actor strike means that Chloe is going to be voiced by a different voice actor, which could tick really? a few people off. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. But the other thing I'm, I'm thinking is Life is Strange was all focused on the gimmick of having this time travel ability. So, um, oh, don't, don't worry, God of War. I won't, I won't get into any spoilers. But Chloe is one of the main uh, characters in the game. And sh her voice actress is going to be different for this kind of prequel, I suppose it is. Um, but... It's it's just it's it's gonna be weird. I don't know. The the entire gameplay mechanic was focused on time travel, but that was only something Max had. Chloe didn't have that. So what's the gameplay mechanic gonna be? Are they gonna somehow give it to Chloe? Where for a portion of her life she has that same ability too, so that they can keep the same because if they change that and it's just like a, a narrative go through the game with little puzzles at that point it's not even really a prequel it's a spin-off so i don't know what they're gonna do i feel like they're gonna rest on the narrative laurels a lot i think they're gonna just roll with that because they already have this established character as you, you saw rachel a lot who's a, a big part of the story and um the original life is strange like you said we don't want to get into spoilers but you know you, you see her brought up a lot in the first life is strange so seeing her in the prequel uh maybe that'll entice players but yeah you're right you know the, the big hook was that gameplay mechanic because that's kind of what separated it from not being a telltale game is you could mm -hmm. rewind tw time uh there was different little things to do throughout the level rather than just walking around talking to people and and having a couple of like choose this or this options one thing I've noticed over time is that there is like this group of people on the internet who 
just despise Life is Strange, think it's really overrated, um, that there's no choice and consequence except for the like final decision you make. Um, I'm going to have to do some more research on that. That's a game I've been wanting to do some research on because I'm curious what people are talking about. But uh, for me, I, I found it really emotionally impacting. I, I thought it was a, a genuine story, um, really well told. Uh, some people insult the writing, but I think it fit the universe well. I've used the word hella since I played that game in 2015. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I'm excited for Before the Storm, definitely. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'll get around to it right away because I don't know what I'll be playing at that time. But yeah, I'm definitely interested. Yeah, no, I, I'm interested to see what they do with it. Lord knows they, they have a lot to live up to. Lots of people bash uh, Life is Strange. And I understand why, you know, the, the writing isn't necessarily uh, relatable to a lot of people. But what I'm telling you, like, it's kind of weird. I have a friend who lives in Oregon. Or lived. Yeah, lived in Oregon. Um, mm -hmm. And he said that, like, they actually say in those high schools, they actually say hella like a lot. It's weird. And Chloe we was, go. if I remember correctly, I think Chloe's the only character that really says hella a lot. Um, I think much. it's mentioned a couple other times, but that's usually like people when they try to bash life is strange, they say that game's writing is hella awful. <laughs> which, oh no. <laughs> which if you're going to criticize the writing, that's a good way to do it. Um, but I don't know. It was, it was a little weird. It was a little weird. I'll give you that. If, again, Tastes change in narratives. I may not like a certain movie that you really like. I may love La La Land and you may hate it. Like, it doesn't mean that one of us is wrong. It just means that, you know, people have different tastes. Um, let's see. Let's see. What da, 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 da. Um, Lukey Poo, what it was the first console you ever owned? The first console I ever owned was... Uh, well, that's, that's, yeah, I clarify, like, that I personally owned or that, like, my family owned. The first console my family owned was, like, a PS2. Um, and we talked about this on Maddie's, pod, Maddie's podcast as well. But, uh, like, I played some PC games before that, like, the original Stronghold Crusader. Played that one on there. Um, really enjoyed that, you know, building castles and stuff. Always fun. But in terms of the first console that I held in my own possession that would be like a 360 that i got uh somebody complained it was broken i opened it up like i don't know if you have you ever cleaned out a dirty like 360 yeah like unholy amounts of dust i don't know what they mm -hmm. could do with that but it's caked in there to the point where you can grab fistfuls of it and so i oh. like dumped it out and then it worked and it ran just fine so that was the first one i had but I, we had like a crappy little i think it was like 460p tv super fat and i was trying to play uh the stick of truth on it and it, like the resolution was so low that you couldn't read the text so it ruined the game for me because I couldn't read anything. And it's, yeah. But that's why, like, you go back and you play some of those old late 90s games or early 2000s and you play them on a super high resolution. Well, compared to back then, a super, like a 1080p is super high resolution. Um, and you play it on there and then you see the text change. It's just weird. Like, it's something you take for granted nowadays, being able to read the text on your screen. <laughs> but sure. that, used, that used to be something that, that uh, you didn't really have. Um, what was the first console you owned? Well, uh, I'll answer it in the same way you did. The first console I had from my family, I had to say, was... Mm, did the Sega Dreamcast come out before the 64? The Nintendo 64? Or after? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, neither am I. I'm going to have to check that. Just give me one second. Yeah, no, you're sure. fine. I'm really curious about that. <laughs> All right, so Sega Dreamcast came out. Let's go to Wikipedia. Came out in North America September 9th, 1999, while the Nintendo 64 came out. Uh, oh, wow, three years before. All right, so yeah, Nintendo oh, wow. 64 was the first console I owned uh, when it came to my family. They bought it for me. I'll always remember coming home from preschool one day. And uh, my mom said, I have a surprise in the back seat. And when I turned around, there was uh, the Nintendo 64 and there was uh, Spider-Man 64 because Spider-Man was becoming a, a popular thing at the time. And I, mm -hmm. I, he's my favorite superhero. So just really good memories with that. <clears throat> I like that game so much. Um, but the first game I or first console, sorry, that uh, I had on my own 
was the 360 as well. Um, the way I got mine was I basically sold my soul to GameStop. I feel so <laughs> stupid because I eventually bought everything back. But I sold like my PS2, the Game Boy Advance SP. Like I sold everything because I wanted to get the 360 with Mass Effect. And uh, I did so, and I, I didn't regret it at the time because it was that new gen console. Uh, for the first time ever, I was playing multiplayer with friends, so I was playing uh, Call of Duty World at War. Um, I got my 360 late. I got it in uh, 2008, so mm -hmm. yeah, I was I was catching up with things. But yeah, th those are the two games I started off with on uh, the first system I ever owned. I wouldn't mm -hmm. say I actually paid for it myself. My my games paid for it, but uh, yeah, that was the first one I got my own on my own. Yeah. Um... I was just about to ask the same question that Sniper TV just asked. Um, you mentioned Spider-Man is your favorite superhero, so I have to ask, what are your thoughts on the new uh, Spider-Man game that Sony's uh, seemingly very proud of? Highlighted their conference. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I am I am all on board. Uh, yeah, there's some bias. Yeah, I love Spider-Man, but um, it, it looks like the Spider-Man game that... that hero deserves um you know yeah the qtes are a little shitty i think that that'll be amended uh because that was really the the largest criticism coming out of there they're like that game was insane but those quick time events insomniac mm -hmm. so like i i feel like they're gonna hear it loud and clear and, and make the proper changes or you know I'm, I'm believing in them to do so but yeah i mean the, i've always said when you're gonna make a spider-man game as someone who, who loves him who studied him it's all about the web. You got to make use of the web. That's his thing. And that's what Insomniac's doing. You're seeing him use the web to like pull in the crane and hit a dude in the head. You're seeing him set these web gadgets up on the wall and it's pulling a guy into a cage. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, of course, the, the kind of free flowish combat system. Not surprised there, but they're they're using the right gimmicks. Uh, Yuri Lowenthal is my favorite voice actor. He's voicing Spider-Man. So it's a dream come true for me. <laughs> so, Man. you know, it, it's uh, I'm very excited for it. I, when I saw it, I was already a little ticked from Sony's conference because I hadn't gotten uh, a Bloodborne 2. I, I was a little upset I hadn't seen anything of The Last of Us Part 2. I, I, yeah, I'm also, I'm not a Nadine fan or Chloe fan from Uncharted. I don't understand why The Last or, or The Lost Legacy exists. I'm a little baffled. Get those people off that waste of time. <laughs> and go work on the last of us part two what are you doing um and like watch is in, in like six months or whenever when i play it i'm blown away and i'm like it's, it's better than the witcher that's what always happens um but like when i i watched the unveil and they're like we have something very special for you i was like okay let's let's see what you got and i don't know when i saw it the way i always view it is when you show something off at e3 you're showing off uh, what you think is the cream of the crop, the best that you have, the thing that's going to make people say, I have to buy this game. At least that's what I would imagine people would do when so. they show something off at E3. But unfortunately, that didn't seem to be exactly what they did. At least if it if that's what they were doing, that might be a little concerning because they didn't choose to show off some, I guess it was large scale and massive and impressive and, and grand on, on a scale sense because you have a crane cl collapsing, but they showed off a, a gameplay sequence, heavy, heavy, heavy in quick time events. Whereas I think they would have been better served to show off some Spider-Man 2-esque slinging around the city, showing off just maybe a, a dynamic questing system. You know, we have some settlements mm -hmm. that need your help or something, <laughs> uh, something like that. Um, just showing the world, letting it breathe, just saying, this is what we have. This is your sandbox. Go for it. Now, that might not be their approach. They might be saying, no, we're going to make this game that is entirely focused on having a narrative very structured quests and some people will love that some people will hate it we'll just have to see but i was not as blown away by it as i i i think they thought i would be um understandably I, so you know yeah. that the, the qtes were a huge turnoff for me as well i, I get what they were going for because it seemed like they wanted to uh almost punctuate those big moments there and make you a part of them my question is, you know, you're giving me flashbacks to Spider-Man 3's video game where when you failed quick time events, you'd have to like restart the mission. And there was there's so many mm -hmm. funny meme videos out there of <laughs> uh, of the failed quick time events in Spider-Man 3. So that's what I got nervous is, is like, what if I fail these? What if I'm not paying attention 
for like that split second and all of a sudden press square pops up it's like oh shit and mm-hmm. i die you know is is that what's going to happen so yeah that's my big concern and why i i, I truly believe they're going to dial it back after the criticism but that's just a belief that's not the case at the moment well but that's the thing is like how at that point because when when the, is it coming out early 2018 is that what they said or just 2018? 2018 yeah or just 2018 um, so with that being said, they have at least time that they could probably re- rework a lot of that. Um, but at that point, like for me personally, I'm not sure what I prefer. I think the way a lot of this uh, works is they end up with um, doing quick time events because they feel like in this moment they need players to be engaged and participating. So they're like, well, we should have button prompts. Instead of just having a cutscene where they show this really epic thing going, so they make you feel like if you screw up, then it's your fault. But the way it works is a lot of the time, like that Spider Man 3 thing, where it's like, oh, you missed circle, sorry, gotta go back, try mm-hmm. it again. Maybe they'll shuffle up the buttons or something. But it doesn't really matter because I, the one time I'm okay with quick time events is like when it's done in uh, until dawn, when they have something pop yeah. up, triangle. And then it's gone. And because you missed that triangle, because you weren't paying attention and ready, the character dies uh, and and there's nothing you can do. You have to face the consequences for not paying attention, not being ready, whatever. But when it just reloads to five seconds before, it gets to the point where we're like, okay, well, what are we doing? Why not just play the video? Yeah, yeah, what was the point of that? Yeah, Yeah, you just broke me out of it. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is... um, Then you you don't want the, the issue of all these big scale moments that you're not a part of um to kind of play out like a movie you know you want some participation in them i think they should turn into a gameplay element where instead of like the crane coming down uh you you know you actually manufacture it coming down and then they play a little cutscene of it you know you you webbing it up against the wall like you did in the in the demo Mm. that could have been a good thing but i i agree that yeah if they wanted to improve that gameplay demo go to that just old-fashioned web swinging around the city Show us the game in general. Show us what we're really going to be playing, not what is obviously a, a pretty scripted story segment. Right. No, I, I I agree with that. So we'll see. We'll see. A lot of yeah. this. We just we'll see. Yeah. Um, Geralt of Rivia. Also, I I should tell you. Uh, looks like Loan dropped in and said uh-huh. hi. He said he just had it. bacon and eggs. <laughs> of course. I, I wonder if he had toast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> probably burnt a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and then he said, anyways, I'm out. Tell Maddie and Lukey, I love them both. Well, glad, glad if you're seeing this afterwards, I'm how alone. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Glad to have you. <laughs> um, Daniel and Geralt are all asking thoughts on star citizen. That's uh, I got, I got to be completely upfront. That's a game I've done zero research on. Okay. That's fine. Sit. <laughs> that's fine. I, I will not try to bullshit you. <laughs> it It's fine. I think, um, the way it looks like it's going, of course, it's a game that's fundraised like $120 million or something like that. Insane amounts of cash. Uh, okay. I missed and, out big time here. <laughs> yeah. No, massively insane. Something where you pay like $800. Uh, like, I don't know if you – do you watch The No at all? On the channel? occasion. Yeah. I watch them off and on. But one of the guys, one of the hosts there, his name is Gus. And he has spent like $850 on – a game that isn't complete that isn't technically out because he it's like the world's worst pre-order where you spend eight hundred dollars and when the game eventually comes out if it ever does you will get uh, a massive ship to fly around now they do have some impressive oh wow people are saying 153 million they've raised 33 million more since i made a video on it now star citizen wow. i made a video on it saying i thought that it would had the potential to be a massive scam because whenever you give $150 million to a group and they they installed these massive like futuristic doors in their offices where like you swipe your card and then these big metal doors swoop in and open and close. Totally unnecessary. A door with a handle would work just fine. But they probably spent 15 grand on these massive doors because they could. And... Uh, uh, they're treating themselves exactly so when i see a company doing that with money they've fundraised from people to receive a certain product that worries me just because I, it gets me thinking this is what they're spending their money on 
uh, do how seriously do they take this? Are they seriously uh, trying to make this up? It's it's a little bizarre. So, of course, paying eight hundred dollars for the game is not necessary. I think you can pay like forty five fifty right now and get access to it. Um, but it's just weird. Um, mm. It's weird. Liam Shaw says, or you can pay eight hundred dollars for Assassin's Creed Origins. Yes, crazy collector's edition. It gets to the oh. point where that that stuff exists just so that they can say they have an eight hundred dollar version of the game. You know, I think they produce just for the people who say fuck it, why not? Right. Like, what are we doing? I'm sure they're going to end up giving away most of them because Lord knows that package is not worth eight hundred dollars. Um. So uh, we'll just. We'll see. Um, let's see. Daniel Shuyu says those doors were given to them by a fan. Uh, okay. If that's the case, then I stand corrected and that's fine. But either way, okay. like, I don't know. I've seen other things they've done that are a little concerning. And rumors were going around that they might be going bankrupt. I have not read into that that much. Um, but I know that that was at the very least a rumor that was drifting around. Um, but the when I first did that video on Star Citizen... I got like the first, no, not the first. I had previously received death threats for saying No Man's Sky didn't look interesting. I said that at like the beginning of last summer. I I told mm. you so. Um, <laughs> but then, oh man. <laughs> and then uh, I, I criticized uh, Star Citizen and same thing. I had probably uh, 500 people subscribed to the channel just so they could go to every video and dislike it for about three weeks after that video. Um, very, very angry. Very angry. Yeah. Uh, Mara says uh, it was debunked. Um, I'm assuming that means the bankruptcy thing. And if that's true, I'm glad because I don't want them to go bankrupt because then a lot of people are out a lot of money. $153 million um, without getting the product. But that's the thing. Rule, the number one rule of all pre-orders, only pay if you are comfortable with the product you get today so if you pay for an early access game like Sonatica, pay for that game if you think that the game you have right now is good enough and if it is you're fine but if you're hoping that you'll eventually get a game that you're happy with then you start you're literally gambling and um i i choose not to do that i think it, it's a little bad when people do that um <laughs> But uh, what are you going to do? Let's see. What was the other thing? Somebody asked a question. Neat Sarah says, what do you both think of Final Fantasy 15? It's development and everything that happened with it. Also, thoughts on the game itself if you played it. I'll let you take this one up because I have not uh, played through that one. But I think you have, right? Yes. I, I actually get the Platinum Trophy for it. I have about 79 hours in it. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I really liked Final Fantasy XV for the the brotherhood, I guess you could say, that they established <clears throat> in the game. Um, going through it again, you, you realize a lot of the flaws with the, the pacing, um, you know, especially Chapter 13. That, that was a long one, and uh, that stretched on for far too long. <laughs> then there was a plot hole, which was then fixed in a future patch, which just released a couple of months ago. Um, but with that support that they're doing, it's pretty cool to watch Final Fantasy XV change because now they have a, and this is going to sound silly, uh, because you have this car called the Regalia. And originally, you, you literally pick your destination and the game autopilots you there. I'm not even kidding. Um, then at, like, you could start to fly that Regalia and then it's more of like a free form like, oh yeah, I can go wherever, but not mm -hmm. really like land wherever. Now you have this off-road version of the Regalia that just released a week ago or something like that a couple days ago and it's actually what it sounds like you can drive anywhere and, and that's not really a big deal in the terms of how games are but when it comes to final fantasy 15 it's like yay finally we can drive literally anywhere um and that's really exciting but also uh each of the dlcs is a, like an episode about one of the main characters uh from the story so there was episode gladiolus one for prompto ignis is coming later on and then they did a little survey where when you start up the game, um, it gives you a list of the potential DLCs they could do, you know, telling Arden's backstory. Um, lots of different ideas. Something about Luna Freya. Um, you know, just all these different ideas. And you vote for one of them. So they're going to vote on what fans want the most. And I thought that was pretty cool. But the game itself, um, I still stand by that. I think it's a very good game. I'm satisfied with the product I got, uh, despite waiting 
like a decade for it, but um, <laughs> you know, it, it was a good game. It had some flaws, uh, expectedly so. With the, I think people should not be surprised if a game is in development for that long that it will have pretty good amount of problems. But uh, I liked Final Fantasy 15 a lot. Yeah, it was uh, last Final Fantasy game I played through before that that I. Well, actually, I, I played through Type Zero HD, and I love that game. So, yeah, I, I stand corrected through myself. But yeah, I like the game. It's a good game. Yeah, no, I, I haven't had time to really uh, invest in it, but a lot of people seem to really, really enjoy it. But it seemed like a game that was really hyped around release, and then it released. And then it just kind of disappeared. And to be fair, there were a lot of um, games that came out soon after, but it was a little bizarre. Like, it, it came out early it, December, I think. It's so, it came out uh, February. Or, I'm sorry, wow, February. Jesus Christ, where's my head at? Uh, it came out <laughs> November. And oh, okay. uh, it, it actually ended up being, uh, the I think they said, the most successful Final Fantasy game uh, in the terms of sales, hmm. I think. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna have to make sure on that, but sure. it did really well, which is uh, which is really good. Um, let's see here, sales record. Let's see here, Final Fantasy 15 sales record justifies massive Square Enix experiment. Uh, no numbers yet. Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, Square Enix's end year results were absurd thanks to Final Fantasy 15. Um, Fiscal year of 2017, which ended on March 31st, the company's end of the year results are frankly ridiculous. The book net sales of 25, whoa, whoa holy shit, 256.8 billion uh, yen, an increase of 200 or 20%. That's ridiculous. Uh, that's all thanks to Final Fantasy 15. So that's how well the game sold. It made a huge increase in their uh, their profits. 20% is pretty massive, yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, there you go. There you go. Uh, let's see. Do 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 do. Um. Uh, oh, we got another question from One Hundred One Mythbusters. Do you think we will see the library of Alexandria in Assassin's Creed Origins? The game takes place almost two decades before it burnt down. Do you think the library will play a part in the story? I'd say absolutely. It, uh, whenever you set a game in a particular time period, a historical time period you have to be aware of the large locations, especially something like Assassin's Creed where unity, you know, you go, you storm the Bastille or you break out of a, a, the Bastille during a storm, um, during the storming. It just, it happens. Like, I, I think they're going to definitely take advantage of that. And I think that's the reason they chose not to show it off was because I think they're saving something uh, cool. But yeah, I'd say the, for sure. The, those games are kind of uh, made or broken on the, uh, I wouldn't say historical accuracy, but the landmarks they feature. So mm -hmm. the more the merrier. Well, that's one thing I, I've always said. The reason I really enjoy Assassin's Creed games is because of the settings. The fact they give you this, uh, you know, in many cases, um, not quite ancient, but medieval, pre-medieval um, city that's completely recreated the idea that i can run through uh paris during the french revolution is really really cool to me and that's one of the reasons i i enjoy the most some people though when i made a video describing that a lot of people were upset because they play it for the modern day sequences which i always saw as more of a chore but apparently mm, some people really love it which is to me, that was totally surprising because it totally didn't connect with me or click that anybody would would look forward to those moments where they're pulled out of the animus and have to stop exploring the city to go through a cutscene. Yeah. But apparently, uh, that's that's just what <laughs> some people like. I don't know. Right. Again, different tastes. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I don't know what else you're gonna do. It's just. Some people have different tastes, and that's that's it. Um, do we have any more questions? Seems like it's slowing down a little bit. So if you have any final ones, we'll start to wrap up. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear any last questions so we get it in. I probably missed a few as we've gone through, so make sure you get them in the chat. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, I just missed one. Um, Shadow Trooper 24 says, Maddie, have you seen the leaked Star Wars Battlefront 2 Heroes from the Alpha? 
Uh, I have not. My friend got into the alpha, but he has not told me anything about it. Uh, in the terms of Battlefront 2, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic for that game, cautiously. But um, it, it seems like EA has learned and they're addressing that stuff, but I have not seen the, the leak yet. And I'm kind of happy I haven't because um, I'm, I'm moderately excited for that game. So sometimes leaks ruin that excitement. I like the, the official reveal, so to say. Well, that's that's a, another question. What do you think of Battlefront 2? We, we haven't talked about that yet. Mm, that's a good that's a good topic. Um, well, yeah, not trying to repeat myself, but, um, you know, the, it, it's just that the, I, I really admired for all they did wrong during their conference that EA came out. And one of the first things they said was we listened to criticism for Battlefront. And like, despite it selling remarkably well, they said that, yeah, we, we get that it wasn't the game you wanted. That's pretty much what they came out and said. Um, I think he said something like not all the criticism was good, mind you. Like he, he made sure to know that they were listening to not just positive feedback that they took into account fans uh, because it's almost one of those too good to be true moments here where we're getting the story, we're getting the full multiplayer. Mm -hmm. um, it, it seems like it's going to be that round package that we wanted the first game to be. Um, and I'm hoping that they really keep up their end of the bargain because they said they're going to be so supporting the game for years. Um, I hope that the DLC is free. I, I really hope that they take the overwatch route when it comes to the multiplayer content here um i know they are with the loot box kind of thing apparently so that's upsetting mm. but um yeah I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to battlefront 2 essentially okay i i mean i'm open to it i bought the first one. i don't even really know why i wasn't super pumped for it <laughs> i've i've said this before i'm not crazy into sci-fi stuff and i think it's okay. honestly i think it's because my name is luke so ever since i was like three people would always make these star wars jokes like hey luke i'm your father it's, that's uh... not creative I know that like everyone says that you're not original. So I started out just hating uh, all of that stuff, but I bought it. I thought it was okay. I played it for like, I think 10 hours or something. Same. But yep. then I was just like, uh, I'm like, uh, I'm kind of bored. So I moved on to something else. And uh, so I'm open to it. I'd like it to be great. I'd like it to be engaging. If I can make another critique on, on a battlefront single player, I'd love to. Like, holy mm -hmm. hell, like, I, I want that. Um, but what are you going to do? Okay, rapid fire, rapid, rapid fire. Let's see what people got here. Um, Sniper TV asks, Maddie, do you think one of EA's secret Star Wars games is KOTOR 3? No. As no. much as I want it to happen, the, the only thing we're going to see is a remaster or a remake. That has a high chance of happening, but uh, and maybe a little bit less because of the Xbox backwards compatibility thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, KOTOR 3, I don't think so. Okay. They'll, they'll, reboot, they'll reboot the series, if anything. We'll see a Star Wars RPG, but who knows it'll be KOTOR. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Captain Condom 69 <laughs> asks, go. what games are you most excited for? Let's do uh, top two. Top two games you're most excited for. I think I got a list of the games coming out. This is your next to me. Ah, uh, there's so many. Um, I don't, so I'll, I'll brainstorm uh, real quick. Let's see here. Uh, I'm very excited for Super Mario Odyssey. That's definitely, like, top of the list, probably, uh, which surprises me. Not really a big Mario guy. Um, but, yeah, that one's really got my attention. And uh, for those out there who are into niche titles, uh, you know, you might not have heard of it, but Danganronpa V3. I love <laughs> Danganronpa, and that's coming out September, so... I'm really excited for that one. Bang and Rampa. Um, mm -hmm. I would say for me, it's probably Assassin's Creed Origins. Uh, and oh gosh. Um, I always do this where I, I blank on a bunch of games coming out. And then There's nothing. too many to keep track of. Yeah, no, like I... I, I mean, do you want me to read off the list a little bit here? Sure, no? sure. Give me some. Give me some. Uh, Wolfenstein 2, The Evil Within 2, Agents of Mayhem. Oh, Uncharted Lost Legacy, your favorite. Um, <laughs> Destiny 2, Dishonored, Death of the Outsider, Marvel vs. Capcom, Token Tournaments, Shadow of War, like you said, AC Origins, South Park, uh, COD World War 2, Need for Speed, Lego Marvel, new Pokemon game, uh, Battlefront 2. That's all I have written down right now. Uh, but, that, um, those are all really good. I mean, uh, the new South Park game I'm, I'm probably going to love. Uh, I don't know how oh, you couldn't. God, yeah. uh, oh, like God. I said, I saw the Despicable Me 3 last night, and they have um, the bad guy in it is voiced by Trey Parker from South Park. Okay. I heard it in the first 30 <laughs> seconds. I was like, I know this voice. 
from somewhere. I don't know where, but I reckon that. And then I clicked and I was, holy crap, it's Trey Parker. Cartman is in Despicable Me. <laughs> That's um, amazing. So it was good. He did a good job. Um, let's see. Mythbusters, should we expect any more collaborations between you two in the future? Get a thumbs up for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. I'd love to. I, I'm going to be doing a Lukey Poo versus Bethesda video in the future. I'm not sure near future. We'll see. Um, but in that, I, I, I think we're going to try to go through and figure out, like I, I posted a, a question on Twitter today asking people if Bethesda was the worst best developer or the best worst developer. Um, and it actually sparked some interesting conversations. I think after E3, a lot of people are just a little ticked, um, which happens, mm. which happens. Yeah. Um, but let's see, let's see. Da, 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 da. Um, Oh, neat. Sarah says the stick of truth is region locked in his country. And I believe he's in Israel. Oh. Can't play it in Israel. Well, I was, I was playing the stick of truth recently and I posted this to Twitter. Um, there is like, you wear the holy yarmulke if he plays a Jew and oh, yeah. <laughs> under the description, you get bonus strength when you are taking burn damage. <laughs> like, oh my God. So bad. So oh bad. God. Uh, I read it and I, I was like, what? What? Oh, <laughs> and then it clicked. It's like, that's so horrible. Um, anyway, <laughs> oh but yeah, I'm totally open to more collaborations in the future. I'm really happy. We might have a, um, Carrick on the podcast. He invited me onto his podcast as well. Um, so yeah, I, I would, I would love to do more. Uh, let's see. Will Anderer says, would you like to see SOCOM come back home? Yes. <laughs> Yo, I love this guy. Yes, I love SOCOM, man. Childhood, please. Uh, I'm, Bring it back. I'm indifferent, but yes, Maddie says yes. Um, <laughs> Don't let me overshadow you here. <laughs> no, you're fine. Uh, Deathstroke says, um, what is the best Bethesda game judging by established in-game lore? If we're just going off of lore, it's, it's got to be Elder Scrolls. They... They, we're talking just the mainstay games because they kind of fucked up Fallout in a, in a certain amount of areas. Nothing like tragic, but uh, enough to piss people off. Um, and then they, and then this is like I said, sometimes Pete Hines does bring the heat to himself when he said like we're not really too concerned about that. We want to make a fun game, and, and then, then people are like, do you not give a fuck about the lore you make? Yeah, because there's a lot of people who take it seriously. So yeah, for me, I'd say when it comes to lore, Elder Scrolls. I would agree. I think what what DLC was it? There was a DLC. They're all kind of blended in my mind, um, which is unfortunate because I, I think it was uh, um, the amusement park one. Uh, Nuka World. Nuka World, uh, where there was like a magician character and he's literally like going up in poofs and transporting around. And yep. th like they didn't even explain it. They're just like, yep, there's magic in, in Fallout now. Congratulations. And like the freaking mm -hmm. uh, the uh, stupid ass old lady that it was like a psychic super high on drugs where they just didn't explain that but she was somehow able She'd to spoil the game for you in exchange for psycho it's like okay right cool mechanic it's like okay so we have a psychic now and we're not like what are we doing guys come on there's a difference between having fun and then just giving up and, uh, and so that frustrated me so i would agree i think elder scrolls um i'm bad at rapid fire i rant uh <laughs> chris griffin Same. Which one will be better, Odyssey or Origins? The two O games. I'd say, I'll be honest and say, you know, it's hard to predict this stuff, but it's like, I'd say Odyssey has a better chance because it's, you know, Nintendo for all their flaws, their first party games are amazing. And Ubisoft has a lot to prove. That's the only reason why I have Odyssey ahead, but you can't really predict that stuff. You just got to wait and I, see. I completely agree. And I think they're, they're different games aimed at different True. audiences in many ways. So I think it's a... Uh... I think it's That's a little different. Too. Real different audience. <laughs> uh, Neat Sarah, what do you think of stealth stealth games briefly? Hmm. There, I mean, when I think stealth now, I think arcane. Um, there's not many stealth games that come out. Uh, Sticks was one. I haven't played that, though. Uh, Splinter Cell, Blacklist, that was a great stealth game. Um, but there's not many, and I'm, I'm probably just thinking too narrowly right now but yeah I, I mean i think of arcane right away and i love mm -hmm. arcane games so yeah no, i i think they they probably still have a place i think it's becoming more niche than it used to be most stealth yeah, games like... recently haven't been selling super well um 
but I mean, that could make a comeback. You never know. But uh, certainly there is a, an element. I think the trend more now is to create games that cater to more play styles as opposed to just one. Um, That's absolutely, yeah, true that. So, yeah, I, I have nothing against them. But in terms of like my preferred way of playing, usually it's not stealth. Um, Geralt asks, here's the question for the century. Fallout 4 or The Witcher 3? <laughs> Oh, come on. Let's be real here. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we were going to get one. Um, yeah. Oh, this one's good. Uh, Arian Narula says, what do you think From Software will do this year? Hmm. That's a great question. How long have they been quiet for? They've been quiet probably for the past. Well, because they came out with, uh, with uh, the Ring City DLC earlier this year. Um in March or May, I think it was, or maybe April, sometime in that three-month span, <laughs> the quarter year that okay. there is somewhere in there. Um, but they've been quiet since then. They had a leaked presentation that said they were going to come out with something in 2017 that was going to be cross-platform. So if that's true, it's probably not a Bloodborne 2, but they might pull a, um, you know, Demon Souls, Dark Souls, and basically create a sequel to Bloodborne but have it be a different series so that they can take it cross platform and make them yeah. money. Um, but like, again, Sony, as far as I understand it, owns the rights to bloodborne. So if they want to make a sequel, which they do, they're going to. And uh, apparently some Sony executives said that they were going to take some games to, um, to, uh, whatever it, it's called their Sony experience, Sony, Oh, uh, yeah, the, the PlayStation experience. I think yeah, PlayStation experience. Um, so, yeah, they're going to bring something. I, I, I think From will probably have a new IP, but uh, Sony will probably come out with, like, a spun-off version of Bloodborne um, from another studio. Yeah, I think it's I think it's time for a new IP solely because uh, didn't they say they're, they're done with Dark Souls now? After yeah, they're, the they're at least putting it on ice. Yeah. But, but I, I mean, mean, it's like... If people think it's going to be, it's permanently gone, they're being a little silly because let's be real. Okay. It, it makes so much money. They're going to make another one. Even if yep. the leadership at From doesn't want to, they're going to get the, the high ups at, at From Software and Bandai Namco are going to say, you're making another one. We'll throw money at you until you do. And eventually they will. Um, will it be incredible? Who knows? But uh, it, it'll eventually, it'll eventually happen. Um, mm -hmm. But let's see. Do, 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 do. What was the next one? Uh, Liam Shaw says, "Will Assassin's Creed Origins be too easy with all the tools and abilities you're given? I mean, that homing arrow is a little bit too far. But otherwise, it looks like it could become a little unchallenging. I think that's fair. Difficulty is something that a lot of developers are bad at, where they think I just criticized on Maddie's podcast the master mode." in um, uh, Breath of the Wild. I think it's a little lazily done. It's not simply a matter of increasing the uh, health bar of enemies and making certain drops more rare. I think there's a lot more to it and we'll just have to see because that's a question that you really can't tell until you get the game itself. So we'll, we'll see. Any thoughts on that? Uh, I didn't even know there was a homing arrow. I saw a little demo though and and they said what happens when you challenge an enemy too high of a level and this, I think he was level 15 he took on a level 25 mm -hmm. and uh, he got destroyed in one hit so yeah. there's that um but yeah I think I, I stand on the side of the uh discussion where I think the more tools the better right because then we were cater like we were just talking about with stealth you're catering to more play styles you're giving more options to approach a situation let me get creative with it uh, that's one thing that Arcane does really well, just giving you the tools and letting you figure out how to get the job done. So uh, I'm not complaining, but if they're like, yeah, something like a homing arrow, it's it's like, all right, then where's the challenge? Do I not even have to aim anymore? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we'll see, we'll see um, what they do. Uh, I, I, I'm open to it. I hope the combat is great because that's been one of the main things that people point out as as a serious flaw with Assassin's Creed. And many Ubisoft games uh, similar to Assassin's Creed, uh, the combat always seems to suffer. So hopefully they, they get it, um, get it fixed up. Uh, thoughts on Kingdom Come Deliverance? 
definitely really looking forward to that as an Elder Scrolls fan and uh, Witcher fan. Just that that looks like a really good fantasy RPG, sure. or not fantasy. I'm sorry, a medieval RPG. I apologize. Um, so yeah, definitely really looking forward to that. I haven't heard too much about it, but I'll be sure to look it up. Um, it's been in development for ages. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, the name sounds familiar, uh, so I, I'm, I'm I'd buy that. Uh, Dean McGill says, "What's your thoughts on a new Splinter Cell game?" Blacklist was kind of like a coming of age thing where they really meshed together everything from every Splinter Cell game and and made I don't want to say the ultimate Splinter Cell game because I think that would be too far and I haven't played enough Splinter Cell to say so but like it took like lots of elements from previous games and and really meshed them all together into one good ass Splinter Cell game. So it's going to be hard to top but I think that uh I'm I'm always fine with more stealth games and I think that uh Splinter Cell has been dormant for far too long because we got Blacklist in 2013 I think. Uh, so yeah, I think I think the time is now for for Splinter Cell. Sure, um, I'm open to it. I actually one of the first like what I would consider adult games that I ever played was uh, a Splinter Cell game. I forget what the subtitle was. Um, oh God, it came on an Xbox demo. Now that you mention it, I remember that too. Yeah, I can't remember it's Chaos Theory. I think yeah, something like that. I, it was just it was kind of fun. It was fun. I, I I'd be open to it. I don't know if I would love it, but um, I I would. Uh, I would enjoy it. Blah blah blah. Let's see what other people see or are saying. Um, I feel like I just read these. People start copying and pasting questions when they <laughs> when they're desperate. Mm -hmm. um, Dean McGill, Crash Bandicoot, Insane Trilogy thoughts. Uh, starting that tonight after this. Really? Um, never played Crash before, so. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, we, we actually brought this up on uh, Maddie's podcast. Carrick was talking about it. I think he, he's playing through it for a review. And he said that it, it just it doesn't translate super well into 2017, apparently, as a remaster. Well, it's not even a remaster. It's a rebuilding of the game from the ground up. Mm -hmm. um, apparently, they barely had any assets left over. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. I, I probably will not get around to playing it. I have a, a lot of other games on my plate. I will be doing a Last of Us critique um, in the near future. And so I'm working on that right now, playing through that. I think I have one more playthrough to go, and then I'll be probably ready to go. Um so that's kind of consuming me right now, but you know, I, I hope people enjoy it. I, the reviews that we're getting, I, I saw like two or three sixes out of tens. Uh, people were really, little, yeah. People were a little harsh on it. Um, I think it was GameSpot gave it a six. It was harsh, not harsh, know. harsh, harsh. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Let's see. Oh, wow. Something just happened. My chat flashed me. It flashed me. <laughs> um okay last we'll do two more questions then we'll wrap up john says do you guys think dishonor 2 will actually be fixed still runs really bad for a lot of people really i i know i had to return it i had to return it uh on steam really quickly after i started playing it it was completely broken for me um okay and then PC Gamer gave it Game of the Year, <laughs> which I found <Wow>. ironic. <laughs> I mean, I, I have to say, um, and I don't want people to think it's out of bias, but um, I, I really do uh, like Arcane Studios a lot. And I had, I, I, I will say this, I, I get very lucky with tech problems. Um, same thing with Bethesda Game Studios. People complain to the high heavens about how buggy their games are notoriously, and I'm always like, Okay, I, I, I see it. I understand it. It's just I never experience it. Mm -hmm. Same thing happened with Dishonored too. Um, like I said, not denying it. You know, it's just it shocks me because I haven't seen too many complaints about it. I've seen more positive reception after the patches and the, the new game plus they added and uh, the the tweaks of the difficulty they added. Lots of cool options. So um, that sucks to hear though because Dishonored two is a very good game. Um, you know, I, I don't think I would have given it game of the year. It, it wasn't on my game of the year list, but um. You know, it was it was definitely a good game that um, if it ran well would be worth your sixty dollars. So that that definitely sucks to hear, mm. um, especially because they patched it a ton. Yeah, it's strange. No, some people it's just destined. A lot of this tends to be engine issues. So if it's still mm. broken, I, I don't think there's any hope. Unfortunately, I think you're you're yeah. screwed. And what's weird is that Prey ran really well. So mm. and there there were not tech problems with that. So I'm, well, that was I'm weird though. Like, that. 
Prey either ran like a dream. Some people were saying they ran on their PC and it was buttery smooth. And then mm -hmm. like IGN's reviewer, he went, he played through it. I don't know the guy's name, but it was all over the place. And yeah, the game Ableton, broke. Remember this. Yeah, yeah, his save states broke, so he had to go backwards, reload it. They provided him with an entirely new copy of the game. He cleared out, deleted everything, re-downloaded it. They gave him a duplicate save with all the same stuff. He went through and it broke again. And apparently it was just yeah. like the worst luck of anybody. So he gave it a 6 out of 10, I think, um, or a 4 out of 10, one of the two. It was a four. I remember that. It was yeah, a four. no, because he was like, "It's broken. I can't play it. If it's broken, I, I enjoyed the parts I had, but um, if the game is broken, I That's can't." That's the thing, and people were were coming at him like, "How could you ever give this game a four? I'm like, "Dude, if a game broke on me once, I'd be like, "What the fuck? Twice? Yeah. I didn't know about that part. Twice? I'd flip the fuck out. I, I, I'm sorry for my language, but I, I'd just be like, "Are you kidding me? Yeah, I mean, man, that's ridiculous. So you know that, like you said, it's, it's for some people, it's kind of like just destined to have a broken game." Uh, knock on wood, where are you at? Right <laughs> yeah. here. I I am lucky that, you know, I, I haven't had many tech problems. I mean, getting Fallout 3 running on PC is, is just archaic technology there. Um, but, you know, I, I've been lucky enough to not have those tech problems and, and enjoy the games as is. But it, it sucks for people who have those problems because both those games are, you know, good enough to, to pick up and play. Mm-hmm. Um, and last question, we'll finish out with this. Uh, Rickening Singlord asks, how long do you guys think Mass Effect will be on ice for, and will it even have a comeback? Hmm. Hmm. It's a good question to end it on. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Because it's that's a series that has suffered such a bludgeoning as a result of that screwed up sequel or because they were trying to start a new trilogy and that's, that's the so i don't i don't know what what they're doing but um we'll see yeah uh in answer to the part of the question where when will you think we see another one i think what bioware is going to do is release anthem and then they are working on new dragon age release that see the reception for both and if both games are really well received they are going to leave mass effect on ice until one of those options is out of the picture where you know they have an andromeda situation where it's like okay this series just has a, a bad name to it despite building up such a wonderful legacy um where yeah i, I think you won't see it come back for a while um because it, it's clear they don't know where to take the franchise their reboot idea or restart mm. um failed so it's like what do you do now do you, do you start over in another new galaxy it, it it really, in the scheme of things, when you take a look at the bigger picture, makes sense why they're putting on ice. Um, it sucks, though, because, um, you know, it was essentially them trying to hit the reset button after the reception. To Mass Effect 3's ending, you know, overall, people really like the game, you know, the story, but Mass Effect 3's ending just left a horrid taste in everyone's mouth, and I'm, I'm sure there's more reasons to it. Mm. But um, the ending was definitely the big thing, and then you restart, and you ruin it again. It's like, what do you do after that, right? So it makes sense to put it on ice as much as it sucks, especially as someone who loves Mass Effect. But um, yeah, that, I, I think we won't see it until at least after the next Dragon Age, or at least rumors of it. Mm. There, no, I, there could, could be sooner now. I, I agree. I, I completely agree. Um, and I think, I think that's it. Uh, people in chat are saying there's slight buffering. Usually YouTube hits that right about at uh, an hour and 45 minutes for me. I don't know why. But it will drop about 120 frames over the course of five minutes. So I don't know why it does that, but it just does. Hmm. It, it reaches a cap and then it gives up. So um, good time to end it. But thank you to Mr. Matty Plays for coming on. Thank you to everyone thank in the chat. Me. Again, YouTube, youtube.com slash Mr. Matty Plays. I'll let you do your plug. <laughs> yeah go ahead check us out there uh we're doing a podcast together uh it'll be up on my channel tomorrow um if you're watching this later on then come to the channel check it out it's a really good show um other than that i do bethesda discussions bioware discussions i really just like to talk about the modern news and uh do the occasional breakdown so yeah that's what i do over at my place uh thank you luke for having me this is a wonderful time uh it's awesome to finally start working together mm -hmm. uh, as someone asked in the chat we're more than open to working together again so I'm sure this won't be the last time I'm here. You're on my show. So that'll be awesome. No, I'm looking forward to it. It's it's the start of a new era. 
It's going to be great. Yes. <laughs> yes. So wonderful. But thank you all for coming out. Really means a lot to us. We'll see you. Make sure you come watch uh, Maddie's podcast tomorrow. Um, we're going to have a great time. We're going to have a great time. Or we had a great time. You're going to have a great time watching it. Yeah. Uh, there you <laughs> but, go. But yeah, yeah. Thanks for watching. We'll see you guys in the next video or sometime else. Bye. Bye. Peace out. <laughs>